Hello and welcome to week 3's lectures. This week we will be hitting a little bit of mathematical stuff, so we don't worry to We'll indicate to you exactly what we need to understand and learn from here. There's a lot more information here than we need, but most of it is for information for those who may be interested, and we'll pick out the bits and pieces as we go through. So, first, life lessons. Mark Twain said, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you realize why. Think about that. We'll discuss it in lectures later. So we'll start off by revising a linear model, and we'll do that in the face-to-face -face session, and also in the labs. Then we'll take a look at the probabilities and random variables. And in these here, we'll take a look at two of the important random variables that this course is all about in the end, and these will be the binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution. These have similarities and differences as well. We'll see how they work out as we go through here. So we'll cover here some basic probability ideas, and uh, then we'll look at some problems, and we'll move from there to the next section, as I said, which is random variables. There are some important concepts here, in particular conditional probability and independent are very important concepts in probability and also in statistics. So here are some of the things you should know by the end of the chapter, but this is very broad. I don't need that you understand everything here, but some ideas of understanding what probability is all about, and how some of these things like the multiplication rule work, and the conditional probability works will be important. So there's a brief history here, which I'll let you read yourself. I won't go through all the details over here. And you can try and see whether you can solve the problem here. The game here that was, uh, in the end, needed to be decided by Pascal was that the game involved throwing a pair of dice 24 times and the problem was to decide whether or not to bet even money on the occurrence of at least one double six during the 24 throws. But the problem is what happens if uh, well first of all what's the probability of winning in the above game if you bet on at least one double six? And that was the problem that led to this whole invention, or if you like, creation of this area of mathematics and statistics called probability theory. Notation. So, let's look at, first of all, what we mean by random. So, random really means that something that cannot be predicted with certainty. In other words, there is some element of chance involved here, some of what we call unknown. And a random experiment is one that generates outcomes that can only be described in terms of probabilities. So anything that's random, you, you will not know whether it's going to happen or not, but we can describe and define and quantify that in terms of probabilities, like tossing a coin or rolling a die are the typical everyday examples of randomness. The sample space is just the list of all possible outcomes. So if I'm tossing a coin twice, then the possibilities are two heads, head and tail, or tail and head in those orders, and tail and tail. So that is the sample space. And any element of the sample space, or any particular outcome there, is called an elementary event. And any event as such is just any subset of this sample space. So for example, an elementary event here is just heads and heads, I can't get anything different, smaller than that in essence. In other words, anything else will still involve two outcomes. And uh, the event here, any subset, for example, this one here is the probability of uh, this one described in the words is at least one head. Whereas this elementary event, still an event, is saying two heads. So these particular concepts are how we define and think in terms of elements of the sample space. Probabilities are assigned in many ways, but the simplest is just to work out the number of favorable outcomes to the event A over the total number of outcomes. So probability of the event A is simply count the number of ways you can get outcomes favorable to A over the total number of outcomes. So here, if I'm looking at tossing a coin twice and I want probability of two heads, well, there are altogether four outcomes here. So there are four possibilities, as we saw in the previous slide, and only one of them is two heads. If I say at least one head, then there are three possibilities, as we saw in the previous slide, out of a total of four possible outcomes. 
And if I say no heads, that really means two tails. And that's only one way possible out of four. And you can simply work those things out by looking at the sample space itself. So probability of two tails means one possibility out of the total of four there. So that's how probabilities are assigned. The null event is essentially the event of nothing happening, contains no outcomes at all. And we denote this by the Greek symbol or Greek letter phi. So if I toss a coin twice and I look at the event of obtaining three heads, well, that's impossible. That's the null event in this case. So we cannot get three heads from two tosses of a coin. Union intersection, these deals essentially with sets. So the intersection of two sets is just all those things that are contained in both sets. And the union of sets is those things that are contained in one or the other or both. So as a sketch here, you can see the intersection is the middle part, which is those things that are in both A and B. And the union of A and B is everything in A or B or both of them together. The complement is, if you like, in one way the opposite. Everything that is not in A is a complement. So in my Venn diagram here, the A is the white bit. Outside A is a complement. Mutually exclusive means that there is nothing in common between those. So A and B are mutually exclusive if they have no intersection. The intersection is the empty set. Here there are various notations for a complement, sometimes a dashed, sometimes a line on top, or sometimes a complement. You'll find that you'll probably more likely use the last one or the second one, but uh, you'll be aware that all these are possible notations for that. So, as an exercise, what is the complement of a complement? Well, it should be clear that the complement of a complement is a itself. And because a and a complement essentially are, have nothing in common, so if this is A, and this is A complement, and the complement of A complement, we'll be back in A here, and A and A complement are disjoint, so that the dissection of these is the null set or empty set. Here are some examples. All you have to do is count things here. So here we're looking at A as denoting the event that the first toss yields a head. So A in that case is going to be heads, heads, or head tails. And the complement essentially be that the first toss isn't heads, which is going to be tail heads or tail tails. Here we want to write an event that's disjoint with A. Well, we know that A and A complement are disjoint, but also anything that is not in A will also be disjoint with A. So for example, if I look at the set here, which is just tail heads, that's disjoint with A. And the other part here, which is tails, tails, is also disjoint with A. Probability. Well, probability itself requires some rules, if you like, or axioms. Axioms is a big word in mathematics. Essentially, it means assumptions, nothing more than that. But here, we can essentially say that these are the rules, or these are the properties that probabilities need to have. And early last century, this Russian mathematician by the name of Kolmogorov was greatly influential in this area to put probability on a firm mathematical foundation. So the three axioms he proposed were, the first is that the probability of the entire sample space is one. Something has to happen. The second is probabilities can't be negative. So probability for any event is bigger than or equal to zero. And if I have two disjoint events, then probability of A union B is probability of A plus probability of B. And we can see that very easily by drawing a Venn diagram here. Essentially, if I've got A and B are disjoint, when I'm looking at counting the number of favorable outcomes to A union B, it's everything in A and everything in B. So these are the three axioms, if you like. I don't require you to remember them. We know the rules, essentially, prob probabilities will hold. So we do know these things will hold, but we can use them to drive other things. So here are some of the rules, and there are proofs in the next few slides, which I will not go over here. But basically, the first one is the probability of the null set or empty set is zero. When nothing happens, that just is nothing happening at all. There's nothing in that set that's zero. Probability of a complement in a, sorry, probability of a complement is when minus probability of a. Probabilities need to lie between 0 and 1 inclusive, so probabilities can't be bigger than 1 when they can't be less than 0 and all that. 
and the probabilities for A union B where A and B are not necessarily disjoint is probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B. And you can see this, and you must have seen this in high school earlier. The idea here is that if I'm looking at probability of A union B when A and B are not disjoint, in the first sum, probability of A and probability of B over the second thing, I'm adding the middle bit here twice. The intersection is added twice, so I would have subtracted off once to make sure I'm not double counting things. That's how this works. So we can use these rules from probabilities, from problem solving. And here is the proofs here, as I said, I will not look at those proofs. An example over here, I'll let you work through this example yourself. It's not too difficult. And the solution is there as well. You can ask questions in the lab afterwards if you wish. I'll stop there for this lecture. We'll take it from there in the next one. Thank you. Bye.